This is the situation that we're in. It's rather appropriate, although none of us set up um, our presentations beforehand in, in communication with each other. This is kind of the Angelina Jolie uh, visually in terms of our concerns at Port uh, Alan Kurdi, of course, which was a, a, a you know, defining moment in the migrant crisis. But these crocodile tears in terms of borders and walls uh, going up rather than compassion. It's also interesting that Barry, um, reaching back into, into history, well, here's another uh, example you know, in an American um, context in terms of, you know, there's nothing particularly new or novel about people fleeing uh, because of their religious, political, um, or in the case of climate change, that they physically can't live in their place, uh, at the homeland. And again, uh, Barry kind of covered this as well. But just to give you a sense, the real refugee crisis is not in Europe. It's actually in the neighbouring countries um, around Syria who are taking in uh, considerably more um, refugees than are being considered, uh, with the exception, of course, as Nessa pointed out, uh, the leadership shown in, in Germany. But the figures are absolutely staggering. And this is from January. So you just you know, uh, escalate that and, and increase those figures. So I'm going to give you some orientating thoughts or uh, health warnings because the first one is one I'm very fond of using. She uses statistics like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. And the banding about of, of statistics, certainly in politics, and I speak um, both as a practicing politician but also as a, a political theorist in terms of you know, studying politics, that we live in an increasingly media-saturated age of politics but also the increasing use of statistical information. And I have a real fear that most ordinary citizens don't often appreciate the way in which statistics can be uh, manipulated and used. And it sounds very hard and it sounds very definite. We have increased in real terms spending on whatever. And I say, well, what's the base year figure? Are you actually describing a real time decline depending on one's views? The second one, of course, would be very familiar. I mean, and to me, it forms the uh, the, the immediate uh, moral basis uh, um, upon which we should be responding to the issues of the refugee crisis uh, in terms of we are each other's keeper. I do want to introduce um, the idea of how we often talk about uh, the refugee crisis uh, is important. The language you use is particularly important. You know, it really irritated me um, last year the way the BBC uh, kept calling them migrants. And migrants carries with it, as I'll describe in a moment, a sense of voluntarily leaving. The issues that Barry talked about of the pull factor. People wanting to improve their economic circumstances, so they voluntarily leave. Uh, rather than using refugees, which has a sense of compulsion. That you're not leaving because you want to, you leave because you, you have to. And that's why I do think we, we should, at this, the scale of the crisis, everyone's a refugee until we uh, the, decide otherwise, rather than assuming that everybody's... A migrant. Thankfully, Nessa touched upon this as well, that we in the West, and certainly America, can be seen as part of the problem in terms of destabilizing uh, the Middle East in Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on. Uh, and we mustn't forget that in terms of uh, a moral or political responsibility that we actually helped cause the crisis. Another way of putting it, they're not here chasing your benefits or fleeing your bombs. And this issue again of the migrant versus the refugee, this is of course echoing the ducking stool that was used against women uh, during the, the witchcraft uh, craze in, in Europe. You know, the idea that, well, if somebody floats, they're obviously a witch when you tie them into a stool and throw them into a river, uh, and they're obviously which so we, we hang them and if they drown well they're going to go to heaven they must have been a good christian and we have some similar view here if they float they're a, mi if they're a, mef or a migrant and if they drown she's a, a refugee and it is important to get our definitions correct i won't read out all of this this is from the united nations uh, definition and the last bit is th this prima facie case of describing an entire distressed forcibly move people as refugees. And again, not calling them migrants. Because I say, because it carries with it that sense that this is a voluntary 
uh, moving the people. Refugees is in the context of a crisis, of a war, um, or increasingly, and there is a kind of a climate change backstory even to Syria in terms of food shortages, uh, partly exacerbating. I mean, climate change didn't cause it, of course, but it, it, it's now an exacerbating uh, risk enhancer that we're now seeing um, across the world. And I don't know whether to be worried or gratified that the, the, the political and economic elites in Davos have now got that on their radar. I mean, sadly, I think they'll probably come up with some sort of carbon capture and sequestration, some sort of mega technology <laughs> would probably be the outcome of that. But that's for a, perhaps another uh, Green Foundation Ireland uh, event. And I do think, I mean, part of the reason why I use um, cartoons is partly as a communication tool, but both uh, teaching, but to get across often, uh, it's a, it is a complex issue, there's no doubting that, as Nessa pointed out, but also in terms of communicating, we have to use, I think, all the tools of communication that we have at our disposal, and I think particularly effective uh, are um, focusing moments like the, the, uh, the photograph that Stefan talked about that then becomes uh, viral in a way, and I think these are other ways of doing it through um, cartoons. And particularly, you know, to challenge this <coughs> quasi-racist and not outright racist discourse that there are terrorists. Why would young, healthy men? I've had these debates on the streets of Belfast, uh, picking at the last assembly election. People, you know, why would young, healthy men uh, not be staying to, to fight? Surely they must be terrorists and so on. And people actually genuinely believe that within the, uh, the, the, the refugee um, flow of people, you know, desperately coming across the Mediterranean that people are actively <coughs> recruiting for, for ISIS, whether well, as Barry said, it's actually the, 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 the trade in terrorism has gone the other way, but it has captured people's imaginations and uh, people actually believe this. So in terms of defining issues, sorry, this is the, uh, the, the academic, we have to get our definitions correct. So there's a migrant, an asylum seeker, and a refugee. Um, Th these slides will certainly be available on the Green Foundation website. I don't feel you have to um, take, them, take them down. But the issue is a migrant voluntarily, refugee is forced. That's the, that's the simple issue. But this, the current situation, and, and Nessa um, touched upon this, is that the, essentially the Dublin system, which is the um, uh, currently broken system that organises EU member states' response, this is now broken in that the right to asylum is now de facto denied by many governments. And not just Hungary. I mean, Hungary is probably the most egregious and most uh, extreme example of uh, EU country denying uh, people their basic international guaranteed legal rights to claim asylum. And particularly then, as again Nessa was touching upon, that we, a bit like the way we did a deal with Gaddafi, which I didn't know about actually in terms of... Um, doing the same thing now with, with Turkey. We don't really know how you're going to do it, just keep people um, away, you know, regardless of the human rights abuses involved in that. And I think there's no way around it, as Barry said, to, to shock people. This is the reality that we have to uh, hammer home. But I will talk a little bit about how we can often trick ourselves, for those of us who are very concerned about it, perhaps possessed of a little bit more knowledge than ordinary citizens, that we have to be of the view that people who have concerns about immigration are not necessarily racist. And it's a trap I think we can fall into, and I'll talk about that um, in a moment. But here's what we're having at the moment, and it's the broken Dublin system where you just get passed along, or people are forced back to the member state where they first came in, even though they may have very good reasons for wanting to go on to some other uh, member state, perhaps they have family there, or perhaps they know the language. And indeed, this uh, mm -hmm. is the position that some Green MEPs, I'm thinking here of Ska Keller, and some other Green Party MEPs came up with it as an alternative to the Dublin system in a report that was produced um, a few months ago. So here's the Dublin system and why it's broken. Um, it really was designed, this issue here, of burden shifting. I mean, it was uh, not responsibility sharing. And, and I think that the central crisis in Europe now is where is the solidarity uh, between, you know, European member states? You know, whether it's with Greece, you know, how can, as Nessa pointed out, how can we uh, wreck the economy or prevent uh, Greece from 
having a viable, sustainable recovery, and then burden it with having to deal with the refugee crisis. And it's, un it's intrinsically unfair what's going on now. There is a real danger of Europe pulling itself apart um, in terms of responding, whether it's to the economic crash of 27, 28, or indeed now in the current refugee crisis. So there's this issue of member states being able to put people back to the first member state that a refugee crossed into. Whereas this is what we should be concerned with. The very fact that you are a human being fleeing for fear of your life, that should be the basic human moral response, not your nationality or indeed your gender, sexuality, none of those things matter. The issue here is of survival. That's in a, in a way what the whole basis of that wonderful document, of course, more observed in the breach than anything else, is the human rights, the Declaration of Human Rights. It's not a declaration of Irish rights, or gay or lesbian rights necessarily, it's human rights. And therefore we need to challenge the, uh, the all too easily mobilizable national sentiment. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm an internationalist, not a nationalist, which confuses a lot of voters up in North Down, I have to tell you, with an accent like mine. Um, that the issue is, I have a real fear of the ways in which nationalism can be mobilized quite easily in an irrational, often irrational manner to mobilize people in a way that rational scientific arguments, for example, don't. They can do great things, but also do some terrible things, as we've seen in history. And I think nationalism, and uh, particularly the, the way in which David Cameron is concerned about UKIP and his right wing of, of his party, that's why he's coming out all strong in his view of this kind of anti-refugee swarm. Uh, I don't, whether or not he believes it himself, I don't know, but I think Barry's quite correct. He is politically calculating. In the same way, I'd say the referendum that we're currently having uh, across the UK has been motivated, not by any great sentiment within the UK population, but more concerns about internal Tory party feuding and fears from the, uh, the UKIP on their right. Sorry, that's another me slipping into academic mode again. And this Dublin system, and if you're really interested in, in trying to figure out why is it Europe has not been able to respond effectively, uh, go look up uh, about this, the Dublin system. You know, it's, it's, bad, it's sad in a way that the system that I'm criticising so much and that uh, Nessa also is named after our, uh, the city we're in now, but it's fecked. It's broken. This is a dead parrot. That won't be poisoned. It is now putting people's lives in danger. It's pulling Europe apart in terms of shattering the ideas of benefit, or sorry, burden sharing uh, and solidarity as opposed to, as I say, this burden shifting. You know, it's almost as if, oh, we can solve the problem simply by not in our backyard. If we don't see it out of sight, out of mind, let somebody else deal with it. And and this is the, uh, the Green MEP's position about, you know, the, the, the preferences of those refugees who do get accepted in have to be taken into account. While we can say they have no right to choose the country that they may uh, settle in and ideally be integrated within, they may have very good reasons for wanting not to stay in Hungary uh, or Austria, but to come to the UK or Ireland because perhaps they can speak English or they already have family members here or some other connection. We need to take the human rights and the preferences of refugees. It should be a refugee-focused approach rather than a state-focused approach, which is what we have um, at the moment. And again, uh, interesting connections with uh, both Barry and, and indeed Nessa's talk. You ship the Statue of Liberty and bring me your huddled masses and so on to Germany because at least they've shown some degree of leadership, unlike most of the rest of Europe, particularly the UK. So what we need, I think, is a system based on a fair allocation. Across Europe, you could have objective or quasi-objective criteria, you know, the size of the country, uh, the GDP, uh, the amount of refugees uh, and asylum seekers already within that country, and go up in a way of fairly distributing so Ireland is not going to be made to take the exact same amount as Germany or the UK, for example. And here, so the issue is the difference between, as he slips back into professorial mode, between equality and equity. 
equity is proportional, whereas equality is, is the same. We need an equitable distribution uh, across the different member states. We need greater harmonization, and indeed we need greater centralization at, at the EU level to coordinate, manage the uh, integration and the processing of people's asylum seeking uh, applications and so on. And this is this European Asylum Support Office, which most people have never even heard of. It now needs certainly more resourcing. I'm here looking at NESA in terms of her role in the European Parliament. This needs more money. It needs more staff. And it needs, of course, the, uh, the beginnings of the reform uh, of a post-Dublin um, system. But I do think the, the issue, and particularly the politicians in the room and activists will be familiar with this, maybe not in this particular academic term, of the importance of communicating and framing. How do we frame a particular issue? Is a particular public spending, do you, do you, do you see it as a negative spending on a cost, has a negative connotation? And you say, no, no, it's an investment. That's just a simple example of how you frame it. And you can say, that's just lying. Well, of course, any of these uh, particular ways of, of expressing a view can be uh, viewed negatively. But the importance of how you present something uh, is really, really important. So the frame there is just the language and ideas that you can uh, use to talk about particular issues. And particularly, unless you're an academic or a geek like me, and perhaps somebody else in the audience, Duncan perhaps, we like facts and figures and science, most people do not gravitate or are moved or motivated by simple facts, figures and statistics. That's not to say they are not important, but in communicating your message, much more important are visual triggers uh, an emotional uh, response, rather than one based upon a cool, calm, clinical. And there's a whole gender aspect of this we don't plan to go into in terms of you know, the way in which we have a very mainstream presentation of the issue of facts and figures. When I beat people, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the connections between communicating climate change and why it has massively failed in terms of just giving people the science. And it's almost like when English speaking, speaking people go to a foreign country and we order a cup of tea in English and then we think if we just speak louder cup of tea please and somehow that's gonna, oh yeah now I get it I think we'd be doing the same thing with climate change just banging people over with you know, tons of carbon to two degree limit for most people they do not connect with that of course we need it, of course we need the science and policy based on, on science but communicating it has to be around what's the story, what's the framing, how does it connect with deeply held values of justice or human flourishing or, or, or a better future and hope. Because the other downside of certainly climate change is that it's unremittingly negative. And I, I tell you as somebody that I'm not depressed but I think I'm a carrier because I do read the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the scientific reports and it is like a trip through the apocalypse. If we keep going the way we're going, we're going to get to where we're headed, and where we're headed is not particularly pleasant. As a politician and as a father, that is not a very positive way to mobilize people out of fear. And people tend to engage in cognitive dissonance. No, 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 I don't know. No. So the, the, the facts by themselves will not move people. I think personal testimony, I mean, again, Barry uh, did this very successfully as well. And particularly, who is saying it? It's the interlocutor. I mean, the sad reality is that politicians often are not the ones that people necessarily trust. I mean, in, in annual surveys of organizations that are deemed most trustworthy across Europe, can anybody guess which one comes out consistently on top of organizations, uh, civil society, and state? But uh, organiza uh, organizations. It is, it's Amnesty International. Amnesty International often comes out of the top in terms of the trustworthiness of... So it's the issue of the... It's not just the message, it's both the medium, how we do it, you know, images, um, emotional cues, but also who's actually saying it. So here's the example of the successful way the anti-immigrant uh, project uh, movement stance has been framed. It's been framed in terms of a threat so when Barry gave a very good example of the outrageous use of that word swarm by David Cameron, swarm infestation, swarms aren't good. 
A gathering. Should we did, did we have a gathering here ourselves? That's good. Gathering is good. They don't call them a gathering of refugees. It's a swarm, a flood, a tsunami. You just look at all of these negative uh, images that are being used. And it's a threat to national security. Or another element of the anti-immigrant perspective is it's a threat to our way of life. It's a threat to settled habits and valued practices and, and ideas and so on. And what they successfully do, because we all have these what are called self-protection or self-enhancing, you know, usually associated with things like materialism, uh, a heightened sense of, of security, uh, your social status and standing, often in gender terms quite male forms of, of values. And what we need to do is, is shift from self-enhancing value framing of the refugee crisis to self-transcendence, of appealing to benevolence that most people would have, issues of solidarity, of care, of concern. These often go along then with respect for the environment. These are other regarding values rather than self-regarding values. And it's not as if we're all either saints or sinners. We all have these. We're bifurcated ourselves, and it depends which framing uh, and how we respond to it according to these different value frames. So I, ha I do have doubts about the necessary value of mobilizing people around the, all the economic benefits of, of the refugee uh, influx, although you know, this is an interesting bait for, for discussion, because it's based on uh, a self-enhancing um, rather than a, a self-transcending frame. And it's also, you could say, precarious. Well, if the native population increases enough, we don't need you. And so on. So it, I'm not denying that it, it can be effective and it can actually mobilize people, but I do think we have to move away from self-enhancing security, economic opportunity kind of framings necessarily of the, of the refugee crisis, and feel more things like human rights, benevolence, care, concern, and not to see these as necessarily woolly and weak, I mean, these value frames are like a muscle. The more we use them, the stronger they become. We need more of the Justin Trudeaus. We need more public representatives, cultural figures, Angelina Jolie, these have been mentioned already, coming out with a muscular value framing in terms of self-transcending values. That it's okay to cry. That it's okay to publicly break down, for example, when you see, as a father, as a parent, another person from Syria going through the same thing that you hope you would never have to go through. You know, we all feel these, yet we don't, where do we see in our politics, our culture, our increasingly sharp elbowed, you know, deracinated ethically uh, perspectives on, on the world? That we do need to say, it's okay to love, it's okay to feel concern, and as public representatives, I think that we need more of that leadership, almost emotional leadership, not just emotional intelligence, but emotional leadership, and that's strong to do so because we're up against some very negative dominant frames out there and ideas, whether it's the market, whether that we're all just entrepreneurs and taxpayers. What about being a citizen? And part of being a citizen is to have care and concern even for those outside one's border. And the importance of the framing is the importance of communicating effectively. Because, as, as both Barry and Nessa indicated, most of probably in the room would know, this ain't going to go away. Not only is this the largest movement of people in Europe since the Second World War, with other threat enhancers like climate change, geopolitical instability, you know, some of the, uh, the, the, the threats that Barry uh, put up about the, the elites in Davos, this is going to be a permanent feature, certainly of the coming decades. And here's the thing, you fix the roof when it's sunny. You don't fix the roof when it's raining. Now is the time to start putting down the infrastructure, changing the Dublin system, changing the conversation in the various publics across Europe around, as I say, this more self-transcending rather than self-enhancing value frame. And the refugee crisis, I think, have been very, uh, very good. And I think they are... are those of us who are concerned with the refugee crisis need to understand people that they are not necessarily races to have concerns. Often it's based on misperception, and sometimes it's based upon ignorance. But we shouldn't dismiss, in a rather haughty, uh, sometimes elitist manner, 
uh, that sometimes you see adult, uh, amongst those who are more compassionate and want something more done about the refugee crisis. We can't simply dismiss those who have concerns about the refugee crisis as somehow xenophobic. Now, there are racist perspectives, and there is concern. We have to listen to people in terms of, and, and reframing and listening to their views in terms of justice. You know, as Barry intimated, certainly in the Irish case, about reminding our citizens, perhaps who hold some of these views, we are a nation of migrants and have been historically. So it was about tapping in what does it mean to be Irish when it means to be a migrant uh, in part. So therefore it's tapping into that particular framing. And the facts, and again I'll go back to the issue of climate change, the facts and the stats will not necessarily convince or to me act as a necessarily effective way of combating people's genuine concerns. So the issue is the storyline and particularly we can't just say, oh, let's have open borders. People have genuine concerns. We want a regulated, managed system that's transparent, that's based upon objectively you know, uh, agreed criteria and so on. So it is about saying it's not about open borders. And that response, which can be a temptation, so you get an extreme closed borders position. The opposite, in my, my view, is not open borders. It's a much better regulated, managed, post-Dublin way of dealing with the, the crisis that we're now framing. So, just to conclude, I think EU governments has to put insurance protection. Uh, and it's interesting that the, the talk, I wasn't here last night, but seemed to touch upon this, that the importance of the most vulnerable. And as a Green, that's always been one of the animating facts of my political beliefs, is that Greens measure progress, not by the size of our GDP, not by the size of our army and the society, but how we look after the most vulnerable. The old, the sick, the temporarily or permanently mentally ill, and now the refugees. And I think people respond to that idea of the vulnerable, because we all know what it's like to be vulnerable. And in particular, you don't have to be a parent to see how seeing children at risk, you know, making that dangerous journey across the Mediterranean, why would you do that unless you are desperate? There's that sense of the push factors rather than the pull factors that Barry pointed out is so important. And what's been wonderful, and many of us perhaps took part in this, and I, I know I did in, in Belfast, particularly around the Calais issue, where you have what I call people-to-people -people solidarity, where people said, sod the state. It's not doing what it should do. So people are going to help people. And it was just gratifying to see that even in Belfast, which you know, has its own troubled history and so on, everyone from all sections of our, our community, our divided community in Ireland, came together around this issue, donating goods, services, hiring vans, boats, buses to go down and help people, both in Calais and then further afield in Kos and, and Greece. And it seems to me that this is, this is what I'm talking about, that self-transcending. How can local, central government enhance and help the solidarity that people feel? Not least because, I don't know whether you've probably seen this, it's, uh, a quote from Tony Benn it says, The way a government treats refugees shows how they would treat the rest of us if they thought they'd get away with it. Again, it's measuring the degree of civilization and progress in the society by how we look after our most vulnerable. And in particular, the idea of challenging that somehow refugees are the problem in our societies. It's a rather uh, muscular, you could say, uh, Anglo-Saxon based, using the, the author uh, E. Banks. As a challenge that, picky in, in Britain, uh, that very simplistic racist discourse that all the problems of the NHS have to do with the migrant crisis, rather than a Tory government that is now systematically dismantling the welfare state. Austerity is not an economic policy, it's a political project. Sorry, we're getting a bit off right there. So, practically I think the European Asylum Support Office has to be enhanced, it should become the centralising element of a post-Dublin dispensation in terms of dealing with the migrant crisis. It has to put into practice, where you get a lot of talk rather than actually action. Often it's, you know, what governments and politicians say, and I speak against myself, I've probably done this as well in the past, 
where we say things and don't practice them. A bit like the Irish football team. Great on paper, crap on grass. So, some take home messages then. Europe is not full. Ireland is not full. People smuggling is a symptom, not the cause. Talk of bombing or you know, just cutting off the head of the snake of people smuggling and so on is basically bollocks. It's political bollocks and has to be called that. It's, it's a symptom rather than the root cause of the problem. But we have to remember it is not necessarily racist. People do have genuine concerns. And certainly the Labour Party in Britain sadly learned that in last year's election, that it didn't listen to people's genuine concerns around migration. There's a wonderful poem I'm going to leave you with from Warson Shire, so we may have seen it. You can't read it. It says, you have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. I'm delighted to see that similar message around the room here, refugees welcome. And this is the, uh, the full poem home. So thank you all very much for listening.